Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Heide Rida from Bain and Company. Uh, my question is what the European Commission and other uh, actors around the table can do to increase the accountability on some of the most important topics uh, in the world. And as case study, I would like to take ISIS. So ISIS has a very slick campaign enabling them to get volunteers all the way from Manchester, 15-year-old girls going there to fight for, to, for, to, to other places in the world, Uzbekistan, Morocco, etc., etc. On the other side, there is a lack of integrated counter-narrative and integrated counter-strategy because obviously there are so many partners uh, involved there. Technology companies have a role to play, think tanks have a role to play. Um, and my question therefore is what can the organizations around the table do to fill that gap so that, for example, if you ask how many people has ISIS killed so far, you would get a clear number, while now okay. Chatham House says 20,000, Oxford says eight, like 200,000, and they all give different numbers, and nobody really has the accountability to give the integrated answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let, let's stay at the back over here. Hi, thanks very much for all your presentations. Um, my name is Tom Ad. I'm just a student at the LSE. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask whether or not you understood um, threats to security primarily um, coming from uh, one of three of poverty reduction, of uh, po prevalence of poverty, the prevalence of horizontal inequalities, or weak governance. Um, yes, I want to know which of those three was a sort of primary. primary. Okay, and then a question at the, in the front row over here. I'm actually going to work my way around, so don't feel you're being left out over this side of the room. Thanks. Uh, I'm Mikhail Gavas. I lead ODI's EU program here. Um, my question is about comparative advantage. Uh, and going back to what the Commissioner was saying about some of the EU's tools and instruments, but I would argue that actually one of the most effective tools um, has been the EU's bargaining power created by its ability to, uh, to make attractive offers, um, either in the form of membership or market access and so on. And so, Commissioner, drawing on your experience, your national experience, I mean, do you agree that without this possibility, or if you like, the carrot uh, of membership, um, that the promotion of democracy, peace and stability uh, is going to be much less effective? in particular in the neighborhood. Thank you. Commissioner, why don't we start with um, that last question since, since it was directed pr principally to yourself. Yes. Well, I would say that European Union's development policy has a lot to, to learn and to draw from the, uh, also from the uh, internal European uh, European uh, uh, policies and the experiences and examples of, of the of the impact of these policies, and actually we come to the uh, in that way we come to the uh, prevailing now prevailing after uh, once the uh, Europe uh, the, the the global agenda sustainable development agenda has been uh, has been uh, adopted. We come to to this concept of universality of, of, of this new agenda, which means let us work together. Uh, to, to tackle the, the, the uh, development uh, issues, be it poverty, be it uh, other de sustainable development goals, uh, to, uh, and to tackle it at home in our internal policies and in our external uh, policies uh, and external operations, development operations in our uh, partner countries. In that context, uh, the, 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 the European Union example uh, in the in the between, especially in the enlargement uh, uh, processes and accession processes uh, uh, since uh, since the late uh, 90s, uh, uh, show us that that the European Union has this this very comprehensive, very complex uh, offer when it comes to uh, to the to the impact of the uh, of of its development uh, uh, policy. So therefore, let us call it carrots uh, uh, or stick and carrots uh, policy that, that that has been a part of the of the of the develop, uh, of the enlargement uh, processes we to a certain extent might uh, bring this this uh, approach also to to our external development 
development cooperation. Yes, indeed, the European Union has uh, to offer a lot uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, development, but also in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of this underlying uh, tissue of, of, uh, of uh, better, uh, better uh, human rights, uh, democratic values, rules of law, uh, uh, environment in the in our uh, in our uh, partner countries. So uh, drawing from the from the enlargement experience, I would say that that uh, that our development uh, development cooperation is very much based on the on the on the uh, on the overall uh, uh, offer or, or, or overall uh, benefits that that uh, the, the the European contribution could bring to to our partner countries. Therefore, this carrot. Uh, uh, approach is there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes in our, there are partner countries who, the, where, where, the, where the, the, the stick doesn't hurt too much uh, and, and where the carrot is not attractive enough. Even, even sometimes in some of the uh, partner countries, some of them could not uh, distinguish what the carrot is and what the stick uh, is. So, so uh, uh, we have uh, different uh, situations, different uh, experience in, in many uh, of, of uh, in all of our uh, partner countries. But but generally, our development assistance is not unconditional, or it might be seen formally as unconditional, as, as focused on the on the on the on the, on the development progress, on, on the development benefits focused on, 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 on eradicating poverty in, 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 uh, in, in partner countries. But on the other hand, there is a lot of other European, I would say even insistence uh, when it comes to, 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 to the overall package what we bring to, um, uh, to our partner countries, which is very much about, uh, about their, uh, their uh, acceptance, their recognition uh, that, that, that uh, uh, overall, other values are important, equally important as, as the, 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 the very uh, impact of the, of the, of the poverty er eradication uh, European uh, uh, Union's mm -hmm. contribution. So, therefore, what we have under the new development goals, uh, especially under new Addis Ababa means of implementation agenda, is or how I see it, the, 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 the true value, the true beauty of this agenda is its comprehensiveness. We no longer speak of, 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 of or, or this agenda is no longer uh, aid-centered, ODA-centered, uh, grant-centered agenda. This is very much about comprehensive package of aid, investment or private sector engagement, and the domestic uh, resources engagement, and above all, or uh, uh, the, the, the good governance, the, 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 uh, the good policies, the democratic uh, values that, that, that are part of, the, of this uh, carrot. And this is how the European <laughs> Union works, and this is how we shall uh, proceed to work. Thank you, Commissioner. Simon, you, there, was, there, there was a question on uh, horizontal inequalities versus the security agenda and the, the role in development. Do you want to Okay, I, I do think, uh, first of all, the idea of being beaten with a carrot is a very nice one. I'm going to try that at home next time I have trouble uh, with the grandchildren. Um, uh, this question about what's the driver? Is it poverty? Is it horizontal inequality? Is it poor governance? And what might you do about it? absolutely plays to the heart of the debate everybody is having about how to do development, in inverted commas, in fragile states. You're having it. Um, the UK has had it in its new aid strategy. And the select committee, which I advise, has been taking evidence on it. And I do recommend reading the evidence from organizations like Safer World uh, and International Alert, which was, I think, last week or the week before, um, on, on this subject, about how do you define fragility? And, the, of course, the obvious answer is, it's a combination of everything. But the key lesson that I've learned from the ODI work on this, and also from the work of the other think tanks, is that you don't solve it by providing just a bit less poverty or a bit less inequality or a bit better governance. It's a kind of much longer term and more complicated issue than that. And for example, I learned from ODI, providing better quality services in South Sudan didn't immediately make the country less fragile. You know. So you have to have 
a deep engagement. And very often in the development business, we are prone to highly oversimplified phrases about deep democracy. And I think what, what we learn from the research is it takes good people on the ground working carefully with local institutions, building change um, gradually. And I suppose the other thing to say is I think it's really hard to be a donor. When you're faced with countries which have egregious human rights abuses, without naming any names on the record, but we can think of a number of countries in Eastern Africa where that might be true, you know, the do you cut off aid or do you carry on dilemma is one that must keep development ministers um, awake at night. Thank you, Simon. Let's take another round of questions. We'll start over this side now. Thank you for your presentation today. My name is Julian Egan. I'm from International Alert. Um, I wanted to pick up on your point about uh, conflict prevention. Obviously, that's, it's great to hear that it's uh, in the mix. Um, in the consultations around the European Neighbourhood Policy Review, there was some uh, criticism about the track record uh, of the EU on conflict prevention with a you know, more technical rather than political economy approach. Um, my question is that at the moment, uh, it looks like we're becoming even more focused on crises rather than investing in prevention. Um, Tunisia, for example, many of the same uh, fragility dimensions as Syria, um, yet a, a fraction of the investment. So how will you strike that balance within the, the global strategy and the work of the EU more broadly to ensure that prevention remains on the agenda? Thank you. Uh, there was one over here, I think. Just uh, right, right here. Front row, and then we're okay. We do it whatever way around. It doesn't matter. I feel bad because I'm also from International Alert, so I'll actually build on my colleague's present um, question. My name's Elizabeth Drew, um, and it's linked actually, and it's really to sort of highlight the not only the preventative role, but also to touch on the. Um, democracy and development link really um, for highlighting the UN process, the peace building reviews, um, which have basically catalyzed a process to look at a very high level sort of um, change and embedding of um, conflict prevention capacities in the way that aid is delivered, in the way that development assistance is delivered. So could something like that um, happen in the EU? That would be very interesting. <laughs> okay, and the uh, road behind. Thanks, uh, Miles Wickstead. Like Anthony, a former head of the European Department in DFID, um, I have a rather specific question, which is, um, do we need to look again at definitions of ODA, an official development assistance, to allow us to do more specifically on the peace and security agenda? I think we all recognize there are some risks about opening up that debate and discussion, but I'd be very interested to get the panel's reflections on whether that's a risk worth taking. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anthony. I'm going to give you first first shot this round. Thank you, um, Kevin. Uh, just a couple of points, really. I think um, just picking up on the point uh, from International Alert One um, on uh, the critique of the neighbourhood policy, technical versus policy, and low investment in Tunisia. We we've been working in Tunisia for a while, um, and I think uh, the two things that strike me about that comment are, first, absolutely, um, you have to engage in that country and in any country with a very clear policy approach and a very good political context analysis. Sometimes the technical issues are the things that you, you need to address. We were uh, in Sierra Leone recently uh, where if you had a list of the top 10 things you need to do at the moment in Sierra Leone, probably getting Hansard out of the Sierra Leonean parliament on time isn't quite at the top of the list. However, actually, when um, we had spoken through the range of the many, many things that the Sierra Leonean parliament need, including running water and toilets that work, um, the, the, the challenge of getting some public confidence in uh, governance of the country includes some very basic things working in the way that they ought to work, like Hansard getting out on time and committees in the Sierra Leonean parliament being able to question intelligently the health minister uh, or even donors, for that matter, about um, uh, the, the Ebola response. Um, and in uh, a country like Tunisia, um, I, th I don't think it's right to compare the amount of money uh, with Syria in 
thinking about addressing those issues. Um, it, it's actually not a matter of money in terms of addressing the governance. There's plenty of money. There's, there's more than enough money around to uh, engage properly with the governance issues in Tunisia. But it's, it's the recognition of the nature of the problems and the willing to address those problems directly, including uh, the, the p approaches that the parties take in the parliament and in government in Tunisia. Then, uh, just on Miles' question on ODA, um, I, won't, I won't talk about um, the definitional issues, although uh, that was part of uh, what I was looking at a few years ago, but um, I think I do come back to uh, the level of resources. I think when looking at governance issues, uh, some people have said um, you need less money and more time. You know, donors are very impatient for results. The complexity of uh, political change makes impact measurement incredibly difficult. Uh, as the Think Tank's paper says, this is patient long-term work which has to be domestically driven. And occasionally, the ODA uh, Leviathan can get in the way of sensible programming and, and push uh, a bit too much for uh, design and implementation of programs that doesn't quite fit that uh, domestic uh, context. Could I just ask you, uh, maybe building on, I, I think, what Simon was hinting at before about this dilemma, you know, the ones dealing with governments in the development project or in the trade relationship that may not have great records in many of the areas that we're concerned about. I mean, is, is it a constraint on, you know, if you look at the Arab Spring, for example, and North Africa, you know, the EU was seen as a defender and supporter, by and large, of regimes which had no legitimacy and no credibility in the eyes of their own population. You know, it's now faced with the challenge of, you know, working with equally difficult regimes with very low levels of trust, actually, among, I, I, I would suggest, the, the public at large. I mean, what, what, you know, how does the EU, against that background and in that sort of environment, play the sort of role you're describing? Well, I, I mean, I think that, um, as Simon was saying in answer to an earlier question, uh, the, you have to, in a sense, be conscious of and able to react to and deal with a whole range of issues. You can't just have one. The extent to which the EU or the US were seen as unquestioningly backing individual regimes, I think people will have learned lessons from that. What I think we see now in working on governance issues is that even in bad regimes, there are bits of capacity that you can work on that will be laying the ground for, for progress in the future. And we see that in, in many, many countries we work in. Thank you. Simon. I, I want to comment on the ODA question, if I Please. may. But Julian, your evidence at the Select Committee was really good the other day. I hope people will look up the transcript. Um, first of all, the EU aid system is actually completely dysfunctional in terms of the budget, because these things are, f are set up on a seven-year cycle which is independent of the appointment of commissioner cycle, so that when you arrived on day one, the framework for the spending till 2020 was already decided, and you know the super tanker had left the port and was kind of sailing off into the distance. And it's kind of really hard to be what we need, which is active and flexible when you're faced with that. And one of the things that the UK and others could help you with, I would like to suggest, is with greater flexibility over the spending, make the midterm reviews, a little bit more visible and do something about the, um, the the partnership arrangements which make change difficult. You know, Andris Peebalgs, your predecessor, fought like a tiger to cut aid to some middle-income countries and increase the aid to the poorest countries. And as Tony Blair once said about reforming the public services, he has scars on his back to prove it, and he made some progress but was still finding it very difficult. Um, I think there are some technical changes we could make to the ODA definition. I'm told, for example, that providing sexual violence training to troops um, doesn't count as ODA, and obviously it should. But I personally think it would be a big risk to open the door of the ODA definition to all peacekeeping and peacemaking activities because the scale of expenditure is so high and the definitional problems about what counts and what doesn't would be so great that it would be very difficult. There's a much bigger problem with aid. Um, uh, Europe is only providing, and it's easy for me to say this as, as, as a British citizen because we've met 0.7. Just, and I'm, I tweet this graph all the time, which comes from the Commission services, just look 
at the share of GNP that is being provided by some very big non-crisis affected European states, mostly in the northern part of Europe. In other words, not Greece, not Italy, not Cyprus, not Spain, but just move your eyes up the map a little bit, where countries that have absolutely no excuse not to be providing 0.7 are providing figures of around 0.4. And the Commission has done a heroic job in making that visible. Uh, Justine Greening and her colleagues constantly say how important it is that other countries step up to the mark. And I think we need to be doing some serious naming and shaming um, and encouragement of countries which are not meeting the 0.7 target. And I mean, I'm, let me say it, let me not run away from, from, from the list. I think Germany, for all its generosity to refugees, is something like, is it $10 billion short of where it would be in aid if it was providing 0.7? France is another one. And, and, you know, this is, for me, this is, uh, we work closely with the German Development Institute who I think would say the same thing. This is not an acceptable level of aid from major donors at a time of great global crisis. And who knows, we're $30 billion, $36 billion short for Europe as a whole of 0.7. Who knows what change we could have made in some of the worst crisis-affected countries, including Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, if we had had the, the, the $36 billion that we're missing. Mm. So, you know, strong message, support the Commission in arguing for countries to meet their obligations, which have been written into Council resolutions over and over again, and countries not meeting their obligations actually devalues their promises for the future. Sam, thank you. On, on ODA, uh, again, uh, if I may just uh, point at, at the fact that that we, among other tasks, we really need to to to, to enter into into modernization and and the new uh, uh, definitions uh, of, of the ODA. Not only because of the of the security development link that is growing, that is getting more and more important, and and even just just in in February there will be another important high level meeting at at the OECD at at, at the development. Assistant Committee at DAC, uh, where, where, where the, the modernization of ODA will be agreed in order to, to try to find a balance between, uh, uh, let us say, making a part, and, and, and Simon rightfully uh, warned that, that not all security related uh, inputs can be taken as, 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 as an as a assistance, uh, as an aid, as, as official development assistance especially not those with, 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 with a clear military uh, military uh, or lethal weapon uh, uh, purposes but but there will be there will be and there is a trend and there will be uh, a, a new uh, definition of, of, of uh, or the a eligibility of the uh, of the part of this or a bigger part of the of the uh, security uh, related uh, uh, efforts but uh, this is not the only the only modernization needed. Uh, it's really about about uh, reaching the the, the 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 commitment, the collective commitment of the European uh, Union of, of 0.7 uh, uh, percent as as the ODA target. And and it is a fact that a number number or or only only four uh, member states are now uh, at at this level of of. Uh, of reaching the 0 0.7 uh, uh, target, all others are below. Some of them well, uh, well below uh, uh, this target. But the the, the present ODA uh, definition would enable, for instance, for 2015, if 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 all the countries, Germany included, would uh, uh, would opt to uh, to report its in-house domestic costs for hosting refugees uh, as uh, ODA and they 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 would have they, they have this right under 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 the present definition of ODA during the first year of hosting the refugees you can you can report it as official development assistance then germany would easily come to 0 0.7 but to what kind of 0 0.7 uh, uh, ODA target because of, of, of uh, hosting cost of hosting refugees, this is not the the way. At least I would like to see the the, the, the development or modernization of uh, of ODA. Even even it seems to me that we have to go 
into into bit of, of, of in, into different directions when it comes to security related uh, ODA eligibility or or as as as, 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 as development community speaks that uh, let us say more uh, duckability for uh, security related uh, development uh, interventions and less duckability for migration or for hosting migrants. Uh, 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 related uh, related uh, development. Thank you, Christian. Any um, f final questions, please? Uh, th uh, three in the front rows here. Thank you. Thank you. Slava Grumluk from Public Administration International PI. Um, in your opening remarks, Kevin, you mentioned about conflict in Ukraine. It's going to be probably almost two years to a day since the conflict erupted, and it showed um, some weaknesses in the European response to that. Um, I think European Union as a whole struggled to keep the rank uh, amongst its members. Some of them were influenced by their economic or foreign policy objectives. And um, I think the development assistance response, including the U Europe um, policy support group that was created for Ukraine, probably also haven't addressed problems of political systems that Anthony mentioned is crucial to resolve conflicts like that. The question to the Commission, I guess, and maybe comments from panel members, what lessons have been learned so far um, uh, from, from that situation and how that can be translated into the development of the strategic Thank documents? You. Thank you very Thanks. much. And two very brief questions at the front, please. We're running yes, out of time. Ulla Bago, former member of the Danish Foreign Service, now an independent consultant. Um, now we're talking about global goods and challenges. Um, I've been involved in that uh, for a couple of years now. And uh, one of the aspects there is also looking at global citizenship. Uh, and uh, uh, widening the whole concept out also to disruption, deconstruction, and unlearning what we know, uh, and using platforms, uh, web platforms, and so and on. If so, you can, if you can move towards the question, because we're, we're yeah. coming very so close. So that is the question: is is this going to be sort of covered in the new strategy? Thank you. Thank you very much. EU has been trying to help Sri Lanka for a very long time. It is very difficult to help Sri Lanka. Um, because it doesn't want to ch change. Uh, it doesn't want to serve uh, justice to its own people. Uh, last week, uh, EU was there, yeah. but um, um, Sri Lanka is not giving in. Um, I just want to say that uh, it's not the lack of money in many places like Sri Lanka that's the problem. It, uh, there are other problems that are related to the lack of money. People think that, oh, there's not enough money, but there are other factors that must be looked into. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner, I'm going to give you an opportunity just to, if you wanted to respond to any of those final questions or, or make any closing remarks to, and then as we, we move towards closure. This might not be the closing <laughs> remark, but, but I would uh, like to say that uh, actually working on a global st strategy that, that, that we in the, in the European Commission and the external <laughs> action services are uh, right now doing uh, is... is is an uh, opportunity and a need to 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 uh, to take on board and to evaluate all our experiences in the in the in the in the uh, present, ongoing, or past uh, security uh, security related uh, and peace building uh, issues, and, and 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 to assess the global role that that European Union could have as as a global global player in the in the in, in the global uh, world. So therefore. Uh, be it uh, the, 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 the experience or, or the, the examples of our, uh, of our uh, actions or non-actions, be it in the Ukraine crisis or anywhere else, uh, I would like uh, this to be, to be really taken uh, very carefully and, and very uh, uh, in, in a way that, that this uh, presents the, the, the basis for the, uh, for the future strategic thinking and strategic approach in our sec global, uh, global uh, uh, foreign and security uh, uh, strategy. Therefore, I would very much appreciate, uh, and, and this, is, this is an open invitation and, and open practice that we have uh, from, from uh, think tank institutes, uh, let, us, let us work together to, 
to, to, to bring your input into, into, into the global uh, strategy structure uh, uh, that, that would be based on, 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 on some of the, uh, of the European experiences uh, and, and European uh, role uh, in the past and how to make it or how to take it forward uh, in, the, in, the, in the new strategic uh, thinking and the new strategic uh, uh, contribution of the, of the new global strategy. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Simon. We accept. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> um, just a final thing I want to say is that Europe works well when it is able to build consensus around action. And sometimes it fails to do that because the interests are divergent, but often it fails to do it because there hasn't been the opportunity to build consensus over time. One of the really valuable contributions that the think tanks group makes is to begin to build consensus across boundaries. I'm a passionate believer in the role of think tanks in creating epistemic communities between, which involve researchers and policymakers at national level. What we try to do in the European think tanks group is to build a similar kind of epistemic community across Europe. Um, and it's important that all these reports we do are not signed by individuals. They're signed by us as a collective. There were 30 authors of this report, for example. I think that it would be fantastic if we could get the Commission to invest in the future of these kind of epistemic communities across Europe because we are the ones, we are the lubricants of better policy, better decision making and faster consensus building in Europe. Thank you, Simon. Anthony. Um, thank you. I think um, the lesson for me about Ukraine is that uh, it's all about governance. We should have addressed 15 years ago those issues more strongly. Right now, there are people, I've met some fantastic Ukrainian parliamentarians and staff who are just getting the tools to push accountability in government, but it will take a long time and we have to keep doing that. I'm tempted to say something about Sri Lanka where we're working, working and have had um, some very good conversations with people who are trying to deliver a change away from a presidential kleptocracy to something more accountable. And I think there's a long way to go, but it's uh, another example where working on those governance issues anywhere on the spectrum can help rebuild trust in government and effectiveness. Thank you very much. So I'm not going to make any attempt at summarising this discussion, but I did, I did make, if I could just make a couple of very brief closing remarks, partly building on what um, Simon and the, and the Commissioner said earlier. I mean, it, it does strike me that if you look across the spectrum of the great development challenges that we're addressing as an international community, and are reflected in the Sustainable Development Goals. Th these are actually first and foremost now collective action problems. That you know, the, an issue like climate change, by definition, has no one nation solution. You know, the, the challenge that the Commissioner mentioned of human trafficking, of, of smuggling, you know, the, these are cross-border challenges. Many of the issues that we're facing in international trade actually f would, would fall into the same category. And uh, you know, to me, one of the lessons of the last of the Millennium Development Goal period, actually, is that some of the initiatives that really brought actors together, and you think of the global funds in uh, vaccination, HIV AIDS, you know, the, the, these funds achieved things that were greater than either the financial sum of the parts or the administrative and management sum of the parts. You know, they saved an awful lot of lives that wouldn't have, have otherwise been saved. And Simon, I think, gave the very opposite example of... Um, interventions and development invest investments uh, in the Sahel region that you know, we clearly need to address some of the instability issues there. It also strikes me that Europe, by virtue of its origins and its underlying values, has a really distinctive role to play in the nobody left behind agenda. And it, it seems to me that the, the danger with that agenda is it becomes one of these buzz phrases like pro-poor growth you know, that hands up if you're in favour of leaving somebody behind. I, you know, I think nobody in this room. But, but translating that into something meaningful, I think, poses huge challenges at, an, at a national level and at an international level. You know, the simple collecting data on who's being left behind, identifying strategies for reaching the marginalised. You know, th this is something which, in better times, you know, I, I believe the European Union had a very strong record in. The, the, the challenge, I think, and, and you know, Simon, you, I think you nailed it in the way that you summed it up, it's that the, the European Union has this enormous leveraging potential in many areas of international development, trade, investment, 
um, aid and other areas. But to unlock that potential, you need consensus across Europe. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And I, I do think some of the challenges that we're facing, you know, whether you look at the refugee crisis or the problem of impunity with respect to international with, with human rights violations, it's because Europe isn't speaking with one voice. You, you know, it may proclaim the same values, but the foreign policies are pulling in very different directions. You know, if you take the UK's position on refugees, it's doing something very positive with the London conference and, and acting as a leader in mobilizing resources for refugees in, in the region. But we as a nation, let's face it, have an appalling record on the treatment of refugees and our contribution to the debate over a humane and effective European response to the refugee crisis. You know, countries that should know better soft pedal on Saudi Arabia because it's commercially convenient to do so. But the truth is that diminishes the currency of European values and I think makes it less of a sort of galvanizing force that people will stand up for in a referendum. So, you know, this, I think this, this debate is really part of a broader discussion about how we reaffirm European values and the European project. And, and just to echo Simon's point, Commissioner, we would be absolutely delighted to work with you in, uh, in, in that shared endeavor. So thank you, thank you to all of the speakers for fantastic presentations. <laughs>